Welcome to the Sports Investor Podcast, where it's all about smart sports betting. Here is your host, Professor MJ. Hello, sports fans from around the world. This is Professor MJ from Quebec City in Canada. Since this is my very first podcast episode, let me introduce myself quickly before getting down to business. I'm a statistics professor at Laval University. Holding a PhD in statistics has helped me tremendously over the course of my gambling career that began around 1999 or 2000. What brought me into the online sports gambling business was something called arbitrage betting, which basically means you are betting both sides of the game with an overall guaranteed net profit, which can be possible under specific conditions. If you want more details about my story and arbitrage betting, go to my website, professormj.com and go to the About Me page. You'll hear about a great anecdote describing my biggest gain ever on a single game. My family is very important to me. At the time of this recording, I've got a very bright three-year-old son named Maverick and a quite athletic one-year-old boy named Jay. Maverick and Jay. Do you see what the MJ stands for in Professor MJ? My girlfriend, my parents and my brother are also key in my life and I thank them for their support. The main goal of The Sports Investor Podcast is to help people who are interested in sports betting in any way I can. Whether you are just starting out and want tips and advice on what to do first, or if you are a more experienced player who's looking for more advanced winning strategies, the Professor MJ brand is there to help you. As of now, I do three things. Number one, I provide free daily picks on selected sports. Number two, I write invaluable sportsbook reviews so that you choose wisely where to open an account and so that you don't get ripped off. Finally, number three, I write informative articles with betting advice or lessons of any sort. These three things have only been in writing so far but I want to expand to podcast and YouTube videos. Make sure you check out my website, professormj.com, or better yet, sign up for my mailing list or join my Facebook group. I'm running a few prediction contests where you can win cash or prizes. Yes! Yes! Enough with the presentation. Let's get to work on today's topic, which is called... Sports Betting 101, Odds and Probabilities Basically, I'll be teaching how sports betting odds work or how sports betting lines work. This podcast episode is intended for those of you who are excited about getting into the great world of sports betting but don't know where to start. Here's a key phrase that you absolutely need to understand when you are done listening to this session. It's all about the odds. Let me say it again. It's all about the odds. You'll see what I mean as we go along. Don't worry if the meaning is not clear to you yet. Before you place your very first bet, you need to have the basics down. It all starts with understanding the odds that bookies are posting on their website. What do they mean? How do I know how much I can win when betting on a certain team? We'll also discuss the two most common types of odds, decimal and American. Then, 
I'll show you the very important relationship between odds and probabilities. Finally, the number one mistake made by inexperienced gamblers will be unveiled. Section number one, decimal odds. I will illustrate odds in decimal format with the three most common types of bets. Money line bets, spread bets, and totals bets. I'll use the example of a fictitious matchup between two teams called the Beast and the Awful, where, as you can imagine, the Beast are the stronger team. Okay, let's start with subsection 1.1 money line bets. Suppose the money lines are as follows Beast 1.5 versus awful 2.8. Now I'm aware it may not be easy for you to visualize numbers in a podcast, so I'll do my best to repeat them as often as necessary and I'll keep the calculations simple. So don't worry, I'll make this session as comprehensible as I can. Again, the money lines are Beast 1.5 versus awful 2.8. When wagering on money lines, you are simply betting on which team is going to win the game. Period. The lines are used to determine how much you can earn when betting a certain amount of money. All you need to do is multiply the amount you are willing to risk by the corresponding money line to figure out your potential return, which includes your initial bet plus your potential profit. For example, recall the money line on the beast is 1.5. If you want to bet $10 on the beast to win the game straight up, your potential return is $10 times the 1.5 money line equals $15. So $15 is your potential return. But remember this amount includes your initial $10 stake which means you are looking at a potential $5 profit. In other words, you are risking 10 bucks trying to net a $5 profit. I hope things are clear to you. How about the case of another gambler willing to risk the same $10 amount, but this time on the awful team to win the game? Since the money line on this team is 2.8, the potential return is 10 bucks times 2.8 equals $28. Again, the $28 return includes your initial $10 bet. So the net profit turns out to be $18. Okay, let's recap. A person risking 10 bucks on the beast is looking at a potential $5 profit, while an identical bet on the awful yields a potential $18 profit. The much higher potential profit on the awful team is simply an indication of them being viewed as the underdogs, the least likely team to win the game, while the beasts are established as the favorites. Let's move on to subsection 1.2, Spread bets. When betting the money line, you are trying to figure out which team is going to win the game. When betting the spread, the margin of victory is what matters. You may lose your bet even though your team wins the game. Just like you could win your bet despite your team losing the match. In the earlier example, assume the spread on the beast is minus 6.5, followed by a 2.0 figure. What I'm saying is, the sportsbook has posted beast minus 6.5, 2.0. Just focus on the minus 6.5 for now. The minus sign indicates you need to look at the final score and deduct 6.5 points from the beast's score. 
if they still beat the awful after subtracting those six and a half points, you win the bet. For example, suppose the beast win the game 20 to 10. Upon subtracting six and a half points from the beast score, from a betting perspective, the game ended 13 and a half to 10 rather than 20 to 10 in favor of the beast. Therefore, a spread bet on the beast is a winner. In plain words, betting the beast with a minus six and a half spread means you expect them to win by more than six and a half points. If they either lose the game or if they win by a one to six point margin, your money is gone. Recall how the line showed up as the beast minus six and a half, followed by a 2.0 figure. I've already explained the minus six and a half part. What about the 2.0 number next to it? This figure, just like the money line, dictates how much you can win, based on your risk amount. It works exactly the same way as the money line. Multiply the amount you are willing to risk by this number and you end up with your potential return. So if you want to bet the beast against the spread at minus 6.5 points for $10, your potential return is 10 bucks times 2.0 equals $20, which, as you now know, corresponds to a $10 net profit after removing the amount of your initial stake. Betting the spread on the awful team functions in a similar way. Suppose the spread on the awful is posted as being plus 6.5 with a 1.9 figure next to it. The plus 6.5 part means you need to add 6.5 points to the awful score to verify if your bet is a winner or not. It basically means you are going to win your bet either if the awful win the game by any margin or if they lose by less than six and a half points. Your money is gone if the awful lose by seven points or more. This time, your potential return can be calculated by using the 1.9 1.9 number. Just multiply it with the amount you are willing to risk. Let's recap spread bets a little bit. Generally speaking, when the spread on a given team is minus x points, it means they have to win by more than x points for your bet to win. Such a team is therefore established as the favorite. On the other hand, A spread of plus x points on a given team means they have to either win the game by any margin or lose by less than x points for your bet to be declared a winner. In this case, we are talking about the underdog. Alright, let's get to subsection 1.3, totals. Nothing complicated here. We are betting whether the total number of points scored by both teams combined will exceed a certain number or not. In the beast versus awful example, suppose the line is set at 51 and that both the over and the under have a 1.95 number next to them. If you believe more than 51 points will be scored in this game, you need to bet the over. The potential return on such a bet can be calculated by using the 1.95 number. If you expect less than 51 points to be scored, you need to bet the under with the associated 1.95 multiplier. If exactly 51 points are scored during that game, all bets on totals get refunded, which means you get your risk amount back. Congratulations! 
you should now be able to understand odds on any sporting event in decimal format. It's also very important to understand American odds, especially if you want to get into arbitrage betting or value betting, which are two winning strategies that I will dive into in future podcast episodes. So make sure you listen to those sessions if you want to grow your bankroll. Let me give you a crash course on the American odds topic. Section number two, American odds. Remember the money line on the beast was 1.5 in decimal format. Its equivalent in American odds is minus 200. A minus 200 money line in American format means you need to risk 200 bucks if you wish to earn a $100 profit. Or if the money line had been, say, minus 148, the meaning is you need to risk $148 if you wish to net a potential $100 profit. You see what I mean? But let's go back to the minus 200 money line on the beast. What if you want to bet an amount that differs from $200? How do you calculate your potential return? I'll teach you how to convert negative American odds into decimal odds, but this will require some higher level of concentration on your part. So listen carefully. Minus X in American odds is identical to the following decimal odds. X plus 100 divided by x. Let me say it again. Minus x in American odds, which in our example was minus 200, which means x is 200, can be converted in decimal format by using the following formula. The numerator is x plus 100 divided by x. In the example, It means minus 200 becomes 200 plus 100 divided by 200. So the numerator is 300 divided by the denominator 200 equals 1.5, which is the exact same money line we discussed earlier in decimal format. Yes! Yes! Let's move on to the money line on the awful plus 180. It means risking 100 bucks yields a $180 potential profit, which is the same as a potential return of 100 plus 180 equals 280. Let me show you how to convert positive American odds into decimal odds. Again, I need your razor sharp attention plus x in American odds is identical to the following decimal odds. x plus 100 divided by 100. Basically, we have the same numerator as before when converting negative American odds. x plus 100. The only difference lies in the denominator, which was previously x but this time it is 100. The formula implies that plus 180 in American format becomes 180 plus 100 divided by 100, which is equal to 280 divided by 100, which is equal to 2.8 in decimal format. And that's exactly what we had previously. Section number three, relationship between odds and probabilities. 
This is an all-important section, so bear with me. Suppose you believe the beast hold a 60% chance of beating the awful in a game where the lines are the same as the ones I mentioned earlier. Should you bet the beast or the awful? Or should you stay away from that game? Remember the important quote I told you about at the beginning of this episode. It's all about the odds. In order to answer the vital question of which team you should bet on, you need to calculate each team's implied win probability. It's actually very easy to calculate. A team's implied win probability is simply equal to 1 divided by the team's money line in decimal format. That's it! Recall the money lines were 1.5 on the beast versus 2.8 on the awful. According to the formula, the beast's implied win probability stands at 1 divided by 1.5, which is equal to 0.6666, which is 66.6%, whereas the awful's implied win probability sits at 1 divided by 2.8, its money line, which is equal to 0.357, or 35.7%. Let's summarize everything we've got thus far. You believe the beasts have a 60% chance of beating the awful, which suggests you also think the awful hold a 40% chance of winning the match. Meanwhile, the bookies' lines imply they believe the beasts have a 66.6% win probability versus a 35.7% win probability for the awful. What do we do with those numbers? Here's the essential rule. Please remember it because it is key to your success in your future sports gambling career. Bet any team for which your estimation of their win probability exceeds the bookie's implied win probability. I think it's worth repeating. Bet any team for which your estimation of their win probability exceeds the bookie's implied win probability. In the example, you believe the beast hold a 60% chance of winning the game, which is less than the casino's 66.6% implied win probability. So you should not bet on this team. However, your 40% estimation with respect to the awful is greater than the bookmaker's 35.7 figure in which case you should bet the awful. This is what experienced bettors call a positive expected value play. In abbreviated form, you'll hear them say it is a plus EV bet, which means positive expected value bet, or in shorter form, a value bet. As a side note, Please understand that I'm not going to discuss in this podcast session how to come up with estimated probabilities. How did we obtain the 60% chance of the beast winning the game? It's the most critical and difficult part when betting on sports. If you don't come up with reliable numbers, you will lose money in the long run. That topic alone could be the subject of many episodes or blog posts in the future, but we are not there yet. The sum of your estimated win percentages always equals 100%. If team A has a 60% chance of beating team B, then team B necessarily has a 40% chance of coming on top. However, 
Notice how the sum of the bookies implied win probabilities did not equal 100%. We found 66.6% on the beast and 35.7% on the awful, which adds up to 102.3%. That's where they get their edge over gamblers and is their source of revenue. It's often called the vigorish or the juice, which is their commission for operating a sports book. Suppose two evenly matched teams face each other on a neutral court, such that you believe each team holds a 50% chance of winning the match. Most bookies will post 1.91 money lines on each team in decimal format, which is the same as minus 110 lines in American format. In other words, you need to risk $110 in order to net a $100 profit. Imagine for a moment that a grand total of $110,000 is wagered by several bettors on Team A, while an identical $110,000 amount is also wagered on Team B. We have what is called balanced action. From the bookie's perspective, if Team A wins the game, it will pocket the 110 k wagered on Team B, while netting a 100k loss on Team A's bets, for a total net profit of 110k minus 100k, which is equal to $10,000. As you can easily see, the bookmaker will also gain $10,000 if Team B wins the game. In other words, no matter which team wins the game, the bookie earns 10 grand. The vigorish is also the cause for staying away from certain games. Let's use one last time the example where we believed the beast had a 60% chance of winning, but this time assuming our estimation was 65% instead. Our estimate is still lower than the casino's 66.6% implied win probability on the beast, so we are not going to bet on them. What about the awful? Since we now believe the beast will win 65% of the time, it indicates the awful should win according to a 35% proportion. That figure is now lower than the bookie's 35.7% implied win probability. Therefore, since our estimated win probabilities are smaller than the bookie's for both teams, you should not bet this game at all. Section number four. The number one rookie mistake. This one drives me nuts. You see it happening several times a day around the world. An amateur gambler looks at the day's matchups and goes, well, I'm sure Team A is going to win this game because blah blah blah. Therefore, let me log in my sportsbook account and bet on them. You have got to be kidding. That is a very wrong approach to sports betting and a surefire way to be a loser. Why? Because that person broke the golden rule. It's all about the odds. How can you possibly make the decision to bet a specific team without even knowing what the odds are? Oh? 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 That person might go, well, I don't care what the odds are, 
Team A is going to win. I can guarantee you that. You have got to be kidding. Please don't ever be that guy. And I want to make sure you have the right mindset to avoid such a detrimental line of reasoning. No team is ever guaranteed to win unless you are pitting professional players against seven-year-old kids. In any sensible league, the worst team still has at least a tiny chance of beating the top team. Whenever someone claims a team is a lock to win, ask him if he is willing to risk $10,000 to win $1. See how he's going to quickly back down. He's likely to respond that you are exaggerating. But the funny part is, he just contradicted himself because he previously claimed he didn't care what the odds were, but he now says no to 10,000 to 1 odds. He might defend himself by saying he didn't care about the odds as long as they were reasonable. But what's the definition of reasonable? I agree that 10,000 to 1 was a stretch. You'll probably never see such odds in practice. But I was just using an extreme example to make my point. Are 98 to 1 odds acceptable? How about 12.7 to 1? Where's the threshold? Just keep in mind the following quote. Just because you are betting on a certain team it doesn't mean you believe they will win. As a matter of fact, most of the bets placed by savvy sports bettors are on teams they don't believe will win. And yet, they turn out to be winners year in and year out. How does that happen? Because they bet on underdogs the majority of the time. As a very general rule, the public prefers betting favorites because it feels more comfortable and yields a success rate above 50%. But it doesn't mean you end up with more money in your pockets at the end of the year since you are risking more money than you can potentially earn. Let's consider a very concrete example. When you roll a dice, Each number from 1 to 6 has 1 chance out of 6 of showing up, right? Now, if I ask you, do you believe we'll get number 3 on the next roll of the dice? Your answer will probably be no, because it's more likely that any of the other 5 options will appear. That being said, if I offered you to bet on Will we get number 3 on the next roll of the dice? The fair decimal odds are yes at 6.0 versus no at 1.2. I'm not going to go into the math that lead to those numbers. Just trust me on this one. So again, fair odds on yes we'll get number 3 on the next roll of the dice are 6.0 versus 1.2 if you are betting against this outcome. If someone was crazy enough to offer you odds on yes at, say, 6.5, which is greater than the fair 6.0 odds, you have to take it, even though you don't firmly believe it is a likely outcome. It's still a good bet. Yes! Yes! If that crazy someone accepted to play this game on four rolls of the dice, it is possible that you lose on all four occasions. You might feel like you did something stupid when in fact you made a smart move. Don't focus on short-term results too much. If you keep making clever bets, you will make money in the long run. If, instead of accepting to play the little dice game only 4 times, the crazy person was willing to play it 1000 times, it's almost impossible that you will end up a loser. 
the probabilities are hugely in your favor. Long-term success is what you should focus on. The same kind of argument applies to sports betting. Suppose the whole world knows Team A is much superior to Team B. Let's say they have an 80% chance of winning, which means Team B holds a 20% chance of coming on top. If the money line on Team B exceeds 5.0, which is 1 divided by 20%, the appropriate decision is to bet on them. So, for example, if the line is 6.3, which is indeed greater than the correct 5.0 odds, I'm going to pound on Team B, even though I don't believe they will win, since my best guess claims they only have a 20% win probability. Don't try to find excuses to go against that by saying things like, Well, Team A lost its previous game, they will be focused and playing like madmen and they will destroy Team B. Or any other nonsense arguments to force you into a bet that is not good to the long-term health of your bankroll. Odds are what matters the most. If you stick to betting teams for which the odds provide a positive expected return, you will do just fine. The key is finding and recognizing such opportunities. I'll do my best to provide you with the best insight possible in that regard. Now that you've got the basics down and the right mindset, you are ready to take the next step towards your winning goals. Section number five. Conclusion I'll eventually record podcast episodes about fantastic sports betting winning methods, including arbitrage betting and value betting. But that's not it. I will also unveil some league-specific profitable strategies based on 10 full seasons of data I own about the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, and of course the NFL. Be sure to check out my website at professormj.com or better yet, join my Facebook group or sign up to my mailing list. Go to the Contact Me page on my website for details on how to follow me. It's time to wrap up this episode, but before I let you go, I'd like to provide you with even more value. If you've listened to this episode, chances are that you are at the early stages of your sports gambling career. The number one question I get asked by unexperienced sports bettors is, which sports book should I open an account with? First of all, you should have an account with more than one bookie. Why? Remember our mantra. It's all about the odds. Getting the best odds possible is critical to your success. So it's only natural to have an account with different sports books, so you can shop for the best odds. That being said, let's go back to the original question. Which sports books should I have an account with? I've literally spent weeks writing in-depth reviews about many of them. I call them my brutally honest sports book reviews because unlike 99% of websites writing so-called reviews that in reality are just there to promote the betting sites, I tell you both the good and the bad about each sports book. I'm not making things look nicer than they truly are. I'm reporting player experiences found on online discussion forums, some of which are dreadful. I also tell you about my own experience with those bookmakers 
including some interesting anecdotes. I invite you to go to professormj.com and click on Sportsbook Reviews in the header menu. The sportsbooks are ranked based on many criteria like trustworthiness, bonus offers, variety of markets and betting options, customer service, and much more. I've also awarded each of them with a grade out of 100%. From the Sportsbook Reviews webpage, you can access my full reviews, which are filled with invaluable information. Alternatively, you will soon be able to listen to my Sportsbook Reviews in podcast episodes and also in YouTube videos. So that's it for my very first podcast episode. It was a pleasure talking to you and I thank you so much for listening through this entire session. To me, if you managed to listen to the whole episode, it means you are serious about educating yourself to become a smart sports investor. You don't want to be a sports gambler or a sports better. You want to strive at becoming a savvy sports investor by making smart moves towards your financial goals, which is the main objective of the Sports Investor Podcast and the Professor MJ brand in general. So again, this is Professor MJ from Quebec City in Canada. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this session and I hope to talk to you again soon. Cheers, everyone.